Thanks for allowing the security blanket. Hafez wrote, out of a great need, we are all holding hands and climbing. Not loving is a letting go. Listen, the terrain around here is far too dangerous for that. We are all holding hands and climbing. Not loving is a letting go. Said another way, we're all profoundly connected. When we fail to remember that, we fail each other. So in our lives, there are, of course, acute times when we're acutely aware of this, when the need is great and the terrain is dangerous. I call these our Mack truck moments. <clears throat> By the time you get to my age, a Mack truck will almost certainly drive right through your free in life, right? Chances are it'll blindside you. Congrats. You are now hashtag adulting. Real adulting, not my roommate won't put his dishes away. The Mack truck, it blares its horn, forces you to deal with it, and transforms your entire life. Job loss, infertility, infidelity, parenting, parenting our parents, addiction, illness, mental illness, divorce, death, and so on. If you get squeamish, maybe look away. Here's the Mack truck that drove right through my life at age 35. Aggressive liver cancer. Um, and prior to this, I had been a good Haas MBA, right? I was on the, the, the corporate fast track. I was accumulating brands and power and dollars and taking myself way too, way too seriously. Suddenly, none of that mattered. I was facing a series of surgeries, including a live liver donor transplant. This is my belly after that. Um, and a really long recovery. In the year 2017, I spent more time in a hospital than I did at home. So what happens when the Mack truck hits? Right? Most of you have probably experienced this. But what happens when you stand back up? It's less bucketless, though I definitely made those, and more perspective shift. What you realize is three things. One, that control is largely an illusion. Second, that you do have complete control over one thing, which is your relationships. And that a fulfilling life has human connection at its core. Third, that we must be broader in our conception of those connections. That it's more, that, that's more about community, and community is more than family or our close friends. Building real connection though, requires both <clears throat> giving and receiving, right? Indiscriminate giving, even. So giving. When I came back to work after all this, my team, for like the first time, said, we actually like you, man. You're like, <laughs> you seem chiller. You're making time for the small talk. You see us, right? And um, it's true. I wasn't in such a rush. Um, I also started a practice of sending a note to a different colleague each week who I appreciated and CCing their manager. But B, we got to be really open to receiving if we want to form these connections. Our pride so often gets in the way of that. Right? Newsflash, real adulting is actually the process, sorry, hashtag adulting, is actually the process of standing back up from Mack truck after Mack truck sometimes maybe pickups and SUVs, right? Our ability to do that relies almost entirely on other people. Not a few people, a lot of people. Not sporadically, regularly. So yeah, I'm brave and I'm tough and all of that. But what helped me most to get through cancer was community. That I felt community at its most vibrant. And, um, and really from this Haas alumni community. So go Bears. They showed up, so many of them, in ways and even people that I didn't expect. They visited me in the hospital. They just rang the doorbell at my house with a casserole and uh, cookies. They, they took me out to dinners and to watch Cal basketball lose. Um, <laughs> they texted me awesomely cringe dad jokes and made YouTube playlists and invited me into their fantasy football league, which I'm pretty sure they let me win. They made a video with messages of support. And it was really illuminating for me to, hear, to see the messages that came in. 
It was not, oh, you had that amazing insight in class or at work, or we're so in awe of the impact you've made in your career. What they said was, I remember that one time that you asked me how I was doing, and you really listened to the answer. Not loving is a letting go. Here's the thing. That community, it dissipated over time, right? That, that's what happens. <clears throat> that amazing feeling of, of being held up, it was ephemeral, even though I still craved it and I still needed it. So my question is, why? Why is it only when the poo hits the fan that we really show up for each other? Does it need to be that way? Because we need that, not just in times of trauma, but through all the complexity of hashtag adulting. We need a fundamental reorientation towards others and away from the compulsion to turn inward. In many ways, to say society's definition of success is not enough. To get my peace and take care of my family and to grab a drink once a month for, uh, you know, with a parent of a child that I can mildly tolerate. <laughs> Um, sorry. American dream or American nightmare? I asked the question. You know we have a loneliness epidemic in this country, right? Surgeon General's warning last year about it. 40% of adults are lonely. And American, middle-aged Americans fare way worse than their European counterparts. We are extremely lonely compared to them. And, and why is that? We're insulated from each other. We insulate ourselves from each other. When was the last time you had a Parisian-style, you know, six-hour dinner with eight friends and eight strangers who became your friends by the end of the night? I'm living the American dream, the one most of us dreamed about when we were sitting right here and the ones that my, the MBAs I currently work with dream about, right? Um, I work it... Um, I have a great job, I have a big house, I have the sports car, I have 2.5 kids, et cetera. Um, I made it, right? But I don't know my neighbors. I can't build real community unless I join the country club, and um, I suck at golf. Um, I don't know who, who to call to watch my kids if I need to. I don't know who to call in the middle of the night when I have to go to the hospital because I'm getting a septic episode. And Trust me, it's not for lack of trying. It's that the family unit in this country is so freaking impenetrable. Sometimes I wonder, should I have like an open house, but not with my house on the market, just to like have an open house? <laughs> um, so the thing I want to impress upon you is that this idea of building community, real community, this is not a nice to have, you guys. This is vital. This, is, this was literally my deathbed epiphany. We are all holding hands and climbing. Have you guys seen the um, Harvard Happiness Study? Like the, lar the longest longitudinal study of human life. It's, it's like eight decades. And um, what is the key to a happy and actually long life? Actively cultivating a broad base of relationships. Not hoping it'll happen. Active. Not small c community. Broad. Remember how great you felt when you were a student here? Right? Here in these hallowed halls, why do we view this as the best time in our lives? Why do we fly across the country and the world to come back here? It's not the ops class. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's the community, right? It's all of us. It's feeling connected to lots of people. Just like I myself have, though, post-cancer, we make the inward turn, right? We forget that. We forget to look up and reach out, even though we intuitively know that's what we need. We know that's the buffer against the Mack truck. Really the only buffer against the, the trucks, Mack and pickup even. We are so freaking busy, but busy with the wrong things. We try to sleep eight hours and eat well and work out, but we forget the most important thing, which is our social fitness. We invest in mutual funds, but not in relationships. We react instead of proacting. And here I need to say a word to the worst offenders, which are my fellow men. <laughs> we are so bad at this. We are like so, so bad at this. One out of five of us say that in the past week we've, had emotional, we've gotten emotional support from a friend. That is less than half the rate of women, right? No coincidence, women live longer. 
Um, and I think we just, as men, have an opportunity to reclaim a new, grown-ass version of masculinity um, that asks that question, how are you doing, and really cares about the answer, right? Um, we don't have to put everything on our partners as we get older to fill every role, which is an impossible task, and that's what men do. Their, their circles shrink, shrink over time, right? Um, we don't have to settle for friends of convenience who happen to be at the soccer game every week with us. And by the way, travel sports, can we chill out? We cannot hang out on weekends. Enough with the travel sports. Um, I ask people, yeah! <laughs> I ask, we have to be like rabid seekers of connection. I actually ask people on mandates. And when we do that, I start with my own vulnerabilities, right? I start with that because that is, that is um, the soil that real connection can um, emerge from. I want to give you one Haas example, which is a, a group of my best friends from Haas who continue to be my best friends. They are mostly Indian guys, so I call them the brown taraj. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, we get together often, and we do Zooms when we can't, um, but we have a simple agenda for these get-togethers, and it is, um, it is this. We go around, and everyone checks in, and we do it for as long as it takes to get through stuff. We don't let you get away with surface updates, right? Um, and the other thing is we don't add distractions. Men are so good at that, right? We have, like, all of our hanging out is event-based. Well... Here we are in New York City last year, and I was like, maybe we should go to a Knicks game. Naveen here is a really big fan. And immediately, everyone's like, no, it's too hard to talk, right? We are guys saying that. Um, so, <laughs> so we need to normalize non-awkward, non-event-based um, hanging out. Um, let me just close with a few more things we can all do to normalize um, happier, more Norm, normalize some, some, some things to become happier and more resilient um, adults and better friends. To embrace big C community and the micro and, and macro acts of love. We can really listen to friends and Uber drivers alike. We can create accountability to get outside ourselves. I used to volunteer with a group of Haas alumni, then we'd sit a meal and debrief on the experience. We can explore co-housing. I have never found someone who wants to do this with me, but ping me if you're interested. <laughs> I'm jealous of the commune. We can make parenting, which is hard AF, right? More of a team sport, like they do in other countries. That village mentality, right? Uh, I've started giving birthday gifts to friends of babysitting plus a prepaid concert ticket. We can show up with a casserole on a regular old Tuesday night. We can accept the trade-offs of needing to be the perfect worker and the perfect parent and the perfect friend, and maybe we can start to choose more wisely. We can be huggers instead of handshakers. We can give an unprovoked compliment to a co coworker without an ulterior motive. We can make small talk before the meeting, and we can linger after it. We can peel ourselves from our phones and our headphones. We can let others in. So, you know, the richness of life, it tracks one-to-one -one with the fullness of the community we build. Remember, active, build, proactive. We can choose black and white or life in technicolor. I know what I choose. So here's my new addition. This is two-month-old Asher. For this guy, for his dad to be the best version of himself, the best and happiest parent he can be, I pledge not to make my life only about him. Won't you join me? Thank you.